My name is Steve Seaverson. I'm the Communications Manager in the Division of Advancement here at Binghamton University. On behalf of the Alumni Association and the Lifelong Learning Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you not only to Homecoming 2019, but also to Tear Talks and our special program for today, Mission Possible, Alumni Changing the World. And certainly you are in over the next uh, roughly nine minutes or so for a very stimulating program, one that lives up to the moniker and the ideals of Tear Talks, the name of our speaker series. And here to say a couple of words about Tear Talks and the purpose and what we're trying to achieve through this speaker series is Marilyn Gaska, a two-time graduate of Binghamton University, member of our Alumni Association Board and chair of our Lifelong Learning Committee. and the chair of the Life Alone Learning Committee. And, but the Tear Talks really started five years ago. This is our fifth, fifth one, and we pick the topic every every year, and they're all on YouTube. But this one will be a memorable uh, event with an international flavor, highlighting our Harper grads. Since this is the 70th birthday of Harper, it's appropriate that we have three Harper alums who have done a lot of things in terms of uh, mission possible change in the world theme. <clears throat> we have... Uh, also, the Decker School of Nursing with a medical flavor, and we'll get to hear Bill. So we do hope that you'll find that these talks today do prove the theory that we're doing a lot of things for talks that inspire, educate, and resonate. So I think without further ado, you're going to be inspired by the next three talks. So back to Steve. Marilyn, thank you very much. So we're going to hear three very interesting stories today from three very accomplished people. Each of them will last about 15 minutes or so, and following the conclusion of the third mini presentation, we'll open up to questions and answers from you, the audience. If you think about the history of Harper College, the history of Binghamton University, this has always been a place that's been socially conscious, always been politically active, and so there's really, I think, no better place to have a program where you look at people making global impacts. And if you ever have a sense of losing hope in the world and the shape that we're in, I think you'll come away from today's session with a very, very different outlook. We'll hear from people who have dedicated their lives to humanitarian endeavors, things like improving educational outcomes, increasing access to health care, trying to stem the tide of global atrocities and genocide. And what's more, the people that are sitting here on the stage with me that you're about to hear from are all Binghamton University alumni. And so there's their accomplishments and what they're doing and the, the impacts they're having on a local and global scale certainly I think will, will give us pride in this university. Our first speaker is a member of the class of 1968, Dr. William Schechter, Professor Emeritus of Clinical Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. And his mini talk, as you'll see on the screen, is titled Academic Global Surgery, a moral imperative. And so in particular, we'll talk about the work that he's done with Operation Access, which he co-founded and served as president of, provides surgical services to the uninsured, lives on the West Coast, established a branch of MedShare International. This is a nonprofit organization acquiring, storing, and shipping medical equipment to hospitals in developing countries. And he'll talk about the work that he has been doing and is doing at Mukumbili University of Health and Allied Sciences in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So without further ado, I'll pass the microphone on the stage to Bill Schechter. Well, good, good, good afternoon, everybody. Despite the uh, tremendous improvements in healthcare in the last 70 years, most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have been left behind with this mean survival rate from birth hovering between 50 and 55 years of age. 300 years of the slave trade followed by a century and a half of colonial rule deprived Africa of basic infrastructure, including public health facilities and an educated populace. Colonial administrators established arbitrary political boundaries, irrespective of the ecology and ethnicity, which subsequently became the borders of independent states plagued by unproductive agriculture, and lack of security due to ethnic and religious violence. Many of the new states in Africa exhibit the characteristics of what Gunnar Myrdal, the Nobel economist, called the soft state, 
namely efficient legislation, law observance and enforcement, and social discipline. As illustrated by this billboard posted at the entrance of the hospital where I work in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. To summarize a complex subject, a healthy community requires political stability, economic viability, educated women, and social equality. Now, security and a viable economy are obvious. What about the education of women? This slide clearly shows that fertility is inversely proportional to the number of years of schooling for girls. And this graph clearly shows that economic productivity is inversely proportional to the fertility rate. But a functioning economy is not enough. By social equality, I mean some degree of equitable income distribution. The Gini coefficient is an index of income distribution. The higher the Gini coefficient, the greater the inequity in income distribution. Now look at the life expectancy from birth of South Africa compared to Malawi. Although South Africa has a tenfold greater GDP, than, uh, it has a 10-year lower life expectancy than Malawi. Now, look at the Gini coefficient of the two countries. South Africa has more than twice the inequity in income distribution. Surgical illness and injury account for a significant percentage of the burden of global disease. Two billion people worldwide lack access to health and surgical care. Almost all of them live in the developing world. Only 26% of the estimated 234 million operations performed annually occur in countries with less than $100 per capita per year spending on health care, which accounts for 70% of the world's population. This situation results in catastrophic preventable gifts of death and disability. For example, half a million impoverished women each year die in childbirth, primarily due to obstructive labor and peripartum hemorrhage. Most of them lack access to obstetric care. Child marriage and female circumcision significantly increase the risks of pregnancy in areas with poor access to obstetric care. And as many as three and a half million women who survived the experience developed vesicle vaginal fistulas, resulting in social isolation and stigmatization due to incontinence and offensive odor. The success rate for the low risk transvaginal repair of these fistulas exceeds 85%, but most women lack access to trained surgeons. Almost 12 and a half million new cases of cancer are diagnosed uh, each year, and seven million cancer patients die. More than half of these cases occur in low and middle income countries. However, the severity of the cancer epidemic in the developing world is rarely discussed. The association between poverty and cancer is so strong that Samuel Broder, the former director of the National Cancer Institute, likened poverty to a carcinogen. 95% of the 5 million deaths due to injury occur in, each year occur in low and middle income countries. Most are due to road traffic accidents. The mass majority of these patients die in the field because of lack of an organized system of pre-hospital care and transport. The survivors who do reach the hospital most often suffer from musculoskeletal injury, but limited access to orthopedists result in a high prevalence of preventable amputation. Now, even if the patient reaches the hospital, facilities and personnel are frequently not up to the task. In a recent survey of 531 hospitals in 17 low and middle income countries, only 70% had intravenous fluids and less than half had a blood bank or equipment and expertise to control the airway and provide assisted ventilation. Well, what can a simple surgeon do to address these problems? which are obviously way above my pay grade. I established the Alliance for Global Clinical Training with the mission of linking high-income country academic surgeons and departments with academic surgery departments in low- and middle-income countries. Since the surgical training period in Tanzania is only three years, we decided to train the trainers to improve their clinical and teaching skill sets 
and hopefully have an impact on the next generation of surgeons. We chose the Muhammadiyah University of Health and Allied Sciences, MUHAS, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, because they had an established educational infrastructure, they were enthusiastic about collaborating with us, they have a functioning economy, and at the moment, it is a secure country. We have 12 participating medical centers, seven in the United States and five in Israel. Experienced surgical educators, often accompanied by one or two of their residents, spend one month teaching rotations at MUAS. We are now in our eighth year of collaboration. The idea is to train the trainers by modeling behavior in the operating room, wards, ICUs, and clinics. Now, against the advice of my wife, Dr. Diesel Schechter, I am going to show you some clinical pictures so you understand the severity of the problem. Now, some of these pictures may be disturbing, so if you wish to close your eyes, go ahead and do so now. I'll let you know when these pictures are done. This is the beautiful campus of the Mulan Building National Hospital. Unfortunately, this is a routine site on morning rounds, an open wound covered with flies. One morning, we encountered an obstetric emergency while searching for some equipment. A brood of newborn mice lying right next to our surgical instruments. This is what we're dealing with. These two ladies lying next to each other in adjacent beds both have metastatic papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. Now, this is a common and usually easily curable tumor in the United States. Maybe some of you in the room have even had a thyroidectomy for this problem. Unfortunately, these ladies presented very late due to limited access to care. This patient had a fungating recurrent papillary carcinoma of the thyroid in an irradiated neck, which was intermittently bleeding. He had been in the hospital for over a year and had received ineffective radiation therapy. And here he is, after a wide local excision of the tumor, a radical neck dissection, and cover of the huge, coverage of the huge defect with the pectoralis major myocutaneous flap. So that skin over his uh, neck used to be on his chest. One of my residents, Dr. Main, assisted with the case, as did our Tanzanian colleagues. Now, for sensitivity reasons, I will refrain from showing you any more clinical slides. We now have a, you can open your eyes if you wish to. <laughs> we now have a full-time Alliance Surgical Director based at Buhas, Dr. John R. Graf, shown here, second from the left, one of our previous resident volunteers. Shown here with her is Dr. Danielle Harry, third from the left, the Chief of Surgical Oncar Oncology at Harvard UCLA Medical Center and an Alliance volunteer in May 2019. As I said, we're in our eighth year of collaboration and have provided through August 2019 30 months of hands-on teaching in the operating room ICU wards, as well as didactic sessions by 18 visiting faculty members. We have introduced more than 15 new surgical procedures to the skill set at the Muhas Hospital, and Dr. Graf herself has provided an additional 10 months of full-time teaching. There have also been 17 months of teaching by our volunteer residents who accompany the faculty members. And I believe that the resident to resident interaction and teaching is critically important. The faculty have also designed seven different two-day didactic and laboratory-based courses on various subjects in the broad range of surgical practice. The idea is to train the trainers and then have the Tanzanian faculty give the courses to their own trainees. We have uh, surveyed uh, both the Tanzanian uh, residents and the accompanying high-income co uh, country residents and published the results in the surgical literature. The bottom line, both the Tanzanians and our accompanying residents responded very positively to our efforts. For some of our residents, like Dr. Graf, it is a life-changing experience. This photo shows a reunion dinner in the Arab village of Abu Ghosh in Israel in June 2019 with some of the Israeli graduates of the program. They were all profoundly affected by the experience. Now, we can't improve the surgical outcomes without improving surgical nursing care, and to that end, we introduced a surgical initiative directed by our Alliance nursing colleagues in 2018, and 
we just gave our second uh, nursing course on surgical intensive care in Dar es Salaam last month. And by the way, here's the advertisement. It's the Decker School of Nursing would like to become involved because we would love to partner with them. <laughs> well, are we improving outcomes? This question is much harder to answer. Subjectively, the quality of grounds in the ICU has improved dramatically. Fluid electrolyte management and the sections have improved. But of course, and of course, the Tanzanian surgeons are now doing procedures which were unavailable to sick patients prior to our arrival. Objective assessment outcome is as yet impossible. We would like to think that the morbidity and mortality rates of surgery have improved, but there is no viable information system in the hospital. Well, the Alliance has designed a simple computer-based information system for the Department of Surgery. It has not been embraced with enthusiasm. Therefore, no one really knows what the total number of operations, their type, mortality rate, or the infection rate is. Well, why should we even be doing this? And this is a question that I've asked myself multiple times over the last eight years. The four basic principles of medical ethics are beneficence, making decisions for the patient's benefit. Non-malfeasance, first of all, do no harm. Autonomy, the patient is the boss. And finally, distributive justice, equal access to care for all. And obviously, distributive justice is a powerful moral imperative for our work. But I prefer to go back to our sources. In Leviticus, we are commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves and not to stand idly by the blood of our neighbors. Now, this is true for everyone. A fortiori, how much more so is it true for the people who actually have the education and the training to stop the bleeding? My friend, uh, Donnie Mosin, who is a very prominent surgeon in Israel, caught the spirit of our work in a letter uh, that he wrote to me, which I translated uh, uh, from Hebrew for you. And he wrote, it's easier to see the big picture, poverty, infections, neglect, disease, giant tumors, and easy to put all this in the blue shadow of death in which poor people live. The great void between Western medicine and African medical practice raises the question, why do it? What difference does it make? All this is just a drop in the ocean. Is it worth the effort invested in big operations or a bit more advanced technology? The road to despair is short, but man is not a drop in the ocean, he wrote. Each person is a world to himself, and each person who saves a life saves an entire world. The world advances forward, but the void keeps enlarging. It is our responsibility to help our fellow human beings join this forward march and they desperately want to join to lessen the void that is measured in so many years. But how to do it? How to begin? Look, we're not going to solve world hunger, and we're not going to bring about world peace. But we can, as physicians, fulfill our duty to the individual patient, a fight to the finish over each and every detail of patient care. That's where we start, when there is the first human contact even a passing glance. A 13-year-old boy scared to death lying in a giant room among rows of dying patients. Behind him, six operative procedures, a colostomy, a colon fistula, and facing him a planned operative procedure. It's not clear who made the decision, but what it is clear is it will be done by a second year resident, and it's also clear what the result will be. Yes, there are many children who will die under similar circumstances, but here, you are suddenly involved, and it's your patient, your project, your responsibility. Everything that seemed impossible yesterday is suddenly realized. Transfer to the ICU, CT scan, parental nutrition, and the boy improves. The instruction resolves, and even if the optimism is limited, the boy is, after all, HIV positive. Maybe in the end he won't survive, but the message is clear. That's the way we treat patients. That's the way we take responsibility. So that's the small picture you wrote. And it is the motor that drives change. Years pass to bring changes of this magnitude, and not every planted seed bears fruit. So why do it? Because it's the right thing to do. Thank you very much.
Our next speaker is Svetlana Meyer. She earned a bachelor's degree here at Dinkins University in 2001 and a Master of Science in Education in 2003. She's co-founder of Higher Educational Institutions. Earlier this year at spring commencement, Svetlana was honored with the University Medal, which is the highest honor bestowed here at Dinkins University. She's a certified behavior analyst and special education teacher, and she's going to talk about her work with an organization called Stepping Stone Center in Bangalore, India. This provides assessment and interventions for children with autism and other developmental disabilities. Her talk this afternoon is titled From Disability to Possibility, Using the Science of Behavior to Change the World. So I have a question for the audience today. How many of you have brushed your teeth this morning? Taking a shower? All right. For the sake of the person sitting next to you, I hope we all have. Um, so you brush your hair, you have your breakfast, um, and you uh, generally didn't have much difficulty with that. But even if you did, you probably asked for some help here and there, and you got your work done. If you're sitting here today, um, I bet you're capable of all of that and more, and that should be celebrated. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm actually not really interested in your dental hygiene or your eating habits, and I'm not trying to be patronizing. The point that I'm trying to make is that these are the skills that we take for granted all the time. These and other basic life skills, like communication, asking for things you need or want, using the bathroom independently and on time, um, all of the fun things like socializing with friends and using social media for most of us these days. These are the things that make life enjoyable. According to the World Health Organization, however, about 15% of the world's population has a disability of some sort. That's over a billion people. Disability is actually an umbrella term for impairments, activity limitations, and participation restrictions. The rates of disability are increasing due to aging populations, uh, an increase in chronic physical and mental health conditions, and still some unanswered reasons. But the point is that from childhood to adulthood, disability is a possibility for all of us. And chances are you have been exposed to the challenges that disability presents either by yourself or through family or a friend. My family and I had relocated to India in 2011, a vibrant, colorful, and warm country. I soon discovered that for a country of 1.3 billion people, Behavior Analysis Certification Board, a governing body for behavior analysts like myself, lists only four BCBAs. Hardly enough for the estimated 21 to 195 million people with disabilities. Now, whichever statistics you choose to believe, that is still a lot of people. That's not to say that there were no other professionals. Medical profession is very strong. Speech, occupational, and physical therapies are well established. But for the population with autism, for whom behavior analysis is the best bet to intervention, four people felt a bit like bringing a knife to a gunfight. We had four BCBAs in just one school district in Connecticut where I worked before that. Here we had four for the entire country. Given my training, it was something my husband and I felt that we had an obligation to do something about. Autism is a serious neurodevelopmental disability which affects an individual's ability to develop language, social skills, and instead often messes up the sensory system in such a way that the kids are constantly trying to figure out which way it's up or down and what's their state of equilibrium. Autism comes from a Greek word auto, meaning self, illustrating the individual's withdrawal into their own world. What's more is that um, the behavior disorders are often accompanying the diagnosis. Aggression, self-injury, vocal and proprioceptive stereotypes make it very difficult for them to learn from a, typically, uh, from a typical educational environment. Currently, the CDC um, identifies that 1 in 59 children are diagnosed with autism in the U.S. However, some global estimates show a prevalence rate of 1 to 2 percent of the world population. Even 1 percent of 1.3 billion people in India is 13 million. That's one and a half times the entire population of New York City. From conversations that followed um, with families of children with autism and other professionals in India, 
it seemed that the lack of services was not the only barrier they had to obtaining appropriate interventions. Prohibitive costs of services and the financial burden were another, inadequate skills of many existing professionals, and poor accessibility to services that did exist due to heavy traffic and driving distances were precluding thousands of families from getting the help they needed. Moreover, in a society where there are very limited educational or vocational programs for these individuals, it also meant that uh, at least one family member um, was dedicated to the care of the one with disability. That meant that that person was a permanent caregiver and is out of being a productive member of society, making her and her child, that's usually the mother, usually um, dependent on the mercy of others. And the implications of this are an increased risk of the physical and mental health of the caregiver. Parents who were once doctors, engineers, college professors, were feeling depressed, isolated, and were no longer working. This seems consistent across continents, but we are actually looking at at least 2% of the population impacted by autism this way, not one. Families desperately needed help and support. So to help fix this problem, um, my husband and I opened Stepping Stone Center, a school and an intervention center for children with autism and other neurodevelopmental disabilities. We imagined that if we could give these children skills to become more independent, to communicate, and to take care of themselves, to get a job eventually, to be productive and contributing members of society, that would not only help those individuals, their families, but the society at large. A quote from Chen Guancheng, Chinese civil rights activist, rang a bell. How a society treats its disabled is the true measure of civilization. But we didn't think of this as just a humanitarian issue of helping people with disability as our charity. No, by working with people with disabilities, we're actually enabling the growth of a country, socially and economically. We were creating new jobs in a niche field. Of all those big reasons, however, it is still the personal, emotional ones that drive me even today. I want to tell you about my first student with autism in, um, in India. Um, Yogi uh, was probably the one that changed my trajectory as a professional, um, and he's the same age as my older daughter, who's now 12. When I met him, he was five nonverbal and did not, could not attend any school. He loved chocolate and chicken and chips and swinging on the swing. Um, he loved to eat butter, plain, and to color the crayons all over the walls. He was hung up, but he couldn't ask for any of it. When I came home, he walked over and plopped himself in my lap. Cute for a five-year-old, but kids grow into adults, and if they still do this, not so cute anymore. As a behavior analyst, I'm trained to view everything we do as a behavior. Sitting quietly during a conference, opening a door when the bell rings, making eye contact, writing four when seeing two plus two, these are all behaviors that have been reinforced in a way that matter to us, which is why we tend to repeat them. They got us what we wanted. Speech is a production of sound as a result of fine motor movements of our articulators, which are behaviors learned through reinforcement. Sounds we made, we made as babies have been reinforced by our family and are selected to be used again. That's why French children speak French, Chinese children speak Chinese, and I speak neither one of those. <laughs> Speech or speaking is a behavior that we started with Yogi. Uh, we started training him to speak, um, to ask for chocolate, chicken, hugs, and butter. When motivation was high, we prompted him to echo words of things he wanted, then gave them to him to establish the association. I say, I get. I ask, I speak, and good stuff happens. We taught him to work for the opportunity to ask for those items. We taught him to label things in his environment, to sit, to complete puzzles, to sort things by feature and function. He was beginning to read. He learned everything fast except to label people. He would struggle when asked, who is this? He would confuse his brother, mother, father, me. The day that Yogi answered correctly, Amma, which is a word for mom, when he was asked, who is this, while I was pointing to his mother, his mom and I broke into tears. We cheered, we jumped, we danced like Dora the Explorer singing, we did it, we did it. And in the process, completely freaked Yogi out. 
Can you imagine what this kid was thinking? That these people are trying to teach me something? They're crazy. Um, but that was a breakthrough moment. There are dozens of kids like this um, in Stepping Stone Center who started as completely dependent, nonverbal, and unaware of their surroundings, now singing at events, having their own exhibits of art they made, or simply going to school with real friends. Turning disability into productivity is incredibly rewarding, and that is why I do this job. I'm fortunate to have two healthy daughters, and I can't imagine waiting for five or 10 years for my children to call me mom for the first time. We all want our children to do the best, to have the best opportunities. We want them to grow, to learn, and to be successful. Maria Montessori said, a child's work is to create the man he will become, or in today's world, a man or a woman she or he will become. Our job as educators, however, should be to help them do it to the best of their potential, regardless of ability. To me, it is not just a job, it's a responsibility. And ABA is the Science of Applied Behavior Analysis. It is my tool to help that job, to help get that job done. After seven years, of its existence, Stepping Stone Center now employs over 50 people, provides direct and affordable services to over 120 yogis on, on an annual basis, and has graduated over a dozen students who um, are now in general education setting where they are indistinguishable from their peers. We developed KidSmart, an online early screening tool for detection of developmental delays, our version of Child Find, which hundreds of parents have used to date. We have developed our own Montessori inclusive preschool and collaborate with other schools to transition children from intensive interventions to less restrictive settings. But that is not enough. There is a limit to how much we can do ourselves. However, if we can get more professionals on the ground, more families can get accessible services all across the country, not just in Bangalore. ABA is a science that helps us understand how we learn behavior and how to change it. Unfortunately, till date, there's not a single university in India that provides ABA training in the menu of subjects for students to choose from or for the interested professionals to get training to be able to obtain it. Fortunately for Stepping Stones, we, um, this is the matter for which our alma mater, Kingdom Sin, stepped in to help. The Institute of Child Development, with the support of Dr. Romanchik and Dr. Gillis Madsen, provided valuable guidance, time, and resources to help us develop training necessary to better equip paraprofessionals in our field in India. Stepping Stone Center has developed an ongoing re relationship with Binghamton University to engage in research collaborations with Indian institutions and universities in order to expand professional development opportunities for interested professionals, culminating in the BCS Annual International Conference on Research, Treatment, and Education for Children with Developmental Disabilities. You're all welcome to attend our second annual conference this December in Bangalore. At this point, we have trained hundreds of paraprofessionals and parents in the practical applications of ABA procedures with tangible, out tangible outcomes for the children we serve. Still a drop in the bucket, but it is progress. While the problem of accessibility to services and training persists, to ameliorate this, Stepping Stone Center is going digital. There may not be enough brick and mortar locations that we can create, but everyone who is out of diapers in India now has a smartphone. And internet is widely accessible. And a massive digital revolution is paving the way for change in the future of education. Stepping Stone's Learning Institute is the new frontier. By leveraging technology, we aim to provide a comprehensive array of educational solutions to families, educators, and professionals in the field of disability services, regardless of where they live. Training 100 professionals impacts 1,000 students, but giving access to training to 100,000 parents and practitioners, we can impact a million children. Now that is an exciting proposition. We have now partnered with College of St. Elizabeth in New Jersey to bring affordable online certification level training for prospective behavior analysts in India. Two have started their training this fall, eight are slated to start in the spring, and we hope hundreds will soon join the Behavior Analytic Tribe. I truly believe that with time and the joint effort, we can all really make a difference, not only in our professional endeavors, but in the world. I want to thank you for listening to this presentation today and I encourage you to learn more about autism as it is a growing concern globally. 
and to support dissemination of science and evidence-based intervention, because that is what can take a person, a family, or a society from disability to possibility. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nani Rubai, a three-time graduate of Dayton University, bachelor's degree in 1985, master of arts in 1987, PhD 1991. She is a professor of public administration here at Binghamton and co-director of the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. An interesting and innovative and relatively new project here at the university started about three years ago and this was funded in large part by donor support and uh, enables us to do something that is uh, tough to find at any university across the country and around the world. And so we're very pleased to, uh, to hear about the work uh, being done through the Institute. And Nadia's talk is titled, Could You or I Prevent a Genocide? We Can and We Must. So what if I told you that you, or the person sitting next to you, or someone three rows or in front or behind you, could prevent a genocide? and that our actions could be as important, or perhaps even more so, than the United Nations or the U.S. government. As Steve mentioned, um, I am not only a Binghamton University alum and professor of public administration, but also uh, the co-director of an exciting and unique new initiative here at Binghamton University, the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. What I would like to do today is use the next 15 minutes to make the case for the potential power of individual atrocity prevention actors, what I consider to be a missing piece in the genocide prevention puzzle. And then I would like to ask you to be one of those individuals. So let's talk first a bit about the Institute. The threefold mission of the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention is to bridge the gaps between the worlds of academia and practice, to break down the silos that keep disciplines and professions from working together, and to bring all of the teaching, research, convening, outreach, and service expertise of a modern university, specifically Binghamton University, to prevent genocides and other mass atrocities. My personal mission within that is to motivate and instill in every Binghamton Bearcat student, faculty, administrator, staff, and you, the alumni and family, a commitment to do their part. Before I go any further, I need to clarify three things. First, for today's purposes, I am not distinguishing between genocides, crimes against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, or other mass atrocities. I use the word genocide in the title to get your attention, shamelessly, but I'm talking about all mass atrocities. Second, it is well established that genocides are processes that develop through some fairly predictable stages and that require the collaboration and participation, or at a minimum, the complicity and the absence of opposition from many, many individuals. Third, well before mass violence, there are early warning signs for those who are willing to see them. Beginning with us versus them thinking and dehumanizing symbolism and treatment. In fact, there are multiple organizations that evaluate the risk of mass atrocity using various combinations of political, economic, and social indicators. The key consideration for our purposes today is not which countries are at the top of those lists, but rather that every country is on those lists. Every place is at some risk of genocide at this moment, no matter how small that risk may seem. So when most people think of genocide, they think of a Holocaust. It wasn't the world's first genocide, but it was supposed to be our last. In its wake, the international community declared never again. Never again, so they said, would the world sit by and watch while such horrors were allowed to occur. We had a name for this crime. It had punishments. And we had an international pledge to protect against it in the future. 
But is Samantha Power, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and, the President, and President Obama's administration and now Harvard University professor, has aptly observed, never again has become the world's most unfulfilled promise. Instead, what we have seen is again and again. In Cambodia, Bangladesh, Darfur, Bosnia, Rwanda, Myanmar, and the list goes on. So is it presumptuous then to think that you or I can make a difference? I don't think so. And that takes us to the heart of my argument, that each and every one of us has a responsibility and an opportunity to help prevent a mass atrocity. To make that case, I need to address the four most common criticisms and objections that I encounter. First is the issue of individual versus institutional response. Some of you may be asking yourselves, isn't that the purview of the United Nations? Or isn't this the responsibility of powerful governments like the United States? Or aren't there already hundreds of civil society organizations doing work in this area? The answers to those three questions are yes, yes, and yes. And it isn't enough. These macro and meso level actors are absolutely essential for genocide response, recovery, and rebuilding. But they have proven woefully inadequate at prevention. So we need to look at the micro level, at individuals. I'm not talking about individual perpetrators. I'm talking about the hundreds, thousands, millions of individual bystanders. People who choose to look the other way and not recognize the signs of impending or actual violence. Given the sheer number of bystanders required to allow a genocide to progress to its more advanced stages, the individual level is the critical point of disruption. Second is the issue of expertise. So you might accept that there could be a role for individuals. But this would be for people with particular disciplinary training or professional expertise, right? Maybe it's for those who study political science, but surely not for those who chose comparative literature. Maybe it's for those who practice law, but not for architects or engineers. Perhaps it's for social workers, doctors, journalists, accountants, and educators, but not for musicians, environmental scientists, restaurateurs, or video game designers. Well, I would argue that we need people from both the obvious and the less obvious fields to be committed to atrocity prevention. We also need people who have stayed out of the paid labor force to raise their families. We need young people. We need retirees from all fields. Atrocity prevention requires that we have all hands on deck. Third is the issue of time and place. There is a common but problematic phenomenon in the world of genocide and mass atrocities, that we are better able to recognize them and be critical of them when they're long ago or far away. We can also begrudgingly acknowledge them when they're in full force, and the evidence of mass killing um, or mass displacement can no longer be refuted. But we're particularly bad at recognizing them when they're close to home or in their early stages. In fact, people who call attention to early warning signs are often accused of crying wolf. Recall that I mentioned that genocides are processes. These processes are not strictly linear, and they often occur over periods of many years. The changes are incremental, and they almost imperceptibly push the boundaries of what we accept as normal, until what is normal creeps towards dangerous. So like the proverbial frog in a pot of water being slowly brought to the boil, we don't recognize the signs until mass violence is well underway. Every place is at some risk of atrocity. No place, no group of people is immune. And so every place is in need of atrocity prevention actors. Fourth is the issue of activism. If you're sitting there thinking, yeah, but I'm just not one of those people who demonstrates and marches and attends rallies, no matter how important the cause. I get it. 
and that's okay. I'm not asking you to drop everything and take to the streets and protest. I am not asking you to quit your jobs, pack up your families, and move to another part of the world. And I'm not asking you to take your life savings and create a new organization or give to existing ones. We do need more activists, we need more humanitarian volunteers, and we need more philanthropic investors in prevention. And we also need you in your current life manifestation with whatever job, living in whatever city, with whatever lifestyle you have chosen. We need people who will contribute to atrocity prevention in extraordinary ways, like Bill and Svetlana, and in ordinary ways. So what exactly could you do to help prevent a mass atrocity? For that, I need to introduce one final concept, that of an atrocity prevention lens. This is a term that was coined by Australian international relations expert Alex Bellamy with the goal of ensuring that government officials would put every decision and action underneath a magnifying glass to examine its potential to contribute to atrocity prevention or alternatively to contribute to higher levels of risk of mass atrocity. What I would like to do is put that magnifying glass, it, your very own personal atrocity prevention lens, in your hands. What I'm calling for is a broad-reaching and creative approach to thinking about atrocity prevention, in which individuals would evaluate their day-to-day -day decisions, large and small, personal and professional, with an eye toward how they might contribute to atrocity prevention. So I ask you to think about your current life, your job, your family, your social circles, your faith community, your travels, your neighborhood, and let's think about ways in which you could contribute to atrocity prevention. For this, we need to assume that nothing we do is neutral. Everything has consequences. And our decisions and actions can either contribute to prevention or they can contribute to the increased risk of atrocity. So in your professional life, depending on your job, atrocity prevention might take the form of considering the implications of decisions that you make about what companies or countries you will do business with, what messages you will allow to be forwarded on your communications platforms, what trends you will take notice of and act on, and how you will test and market new products or technology. And we can be prevention actors in our personal lives, in our roles as parents, neighbors, tourists, consumers, and citizens. We contribute to atrocity prevention when we teach our children to resolve conflict without resorting to violence. When we consider in our decisions about what to buy, where to travel, for whom to vote, and what we post on social media, the implications for atrocity prevention or atrocity risk. When we remind our fellow worshipers that compassion, love, and basic humanity are the fundamental tenets of every major religion. And when we take the time to reach out and genuinely get to know people with different cultural, religious, and political beliefs. It's not rocket science. It's atrocity prevention, and to do it well, we need a lot of individual prevention actors. So before wrapping up, I would like to address one last critique, masquerading as a question, that I and my colleagues at the Institute hear all of the time. That is, how will we ever know if what you or I have done has actually prevented an atrocity? Because prevention is ultimately about what doesn't happen, we run up against the age-old conundrum of how to prove a negative. And we can't. What we can show is that our actions contribute to intermediary conditions, which are associated with less risk and fewer occurrences of mass violence. So recall earlier that I mentioned models which evaluate risk based on various indicators. For every indicator of risk, there are counter indicators of resilience. Our actions can effectively
gently tip the scales in favor of resilience so that our community, our society, can experience some risk, be able to push back without advancing further toward genocide. In some respects, never again is such an overused phrase and an unfulfilled promise that it might be tempting to abandon it. But we can't. It has to remain the aspirational goal until it's realized. Accepting individual responsibility for prevention does not release the governments and international actors from their responsibilities. We can and should critique the failures of the United Nations and of individual governments, including the United States, and insist that they do better. And at the same time, we can and must, each and every one of us, do our part as individuals. So in summary, we need individuals, not just institutions, to be committed to atrocity prevention. We all have a role to play, regardless of our degrees and our jobs. We need atrocity prevention actors everywhere and now. And this doesn't have to involve massive disruptions of your life. Take your personal atrocity prevention lens and apply it to your decisions. Help us build resilience. I'm dedicated to doing my part, and I ask you to join me in this mission possible. Be one of the Binghamton University alumni changing the world for the better. Be part of a growing cadre of individual atrocity prevention actors. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to open it up to you, the audience, for any questions that you might like to ask. So please feel free. Yes, Gary. Uh, just a question for all three of your organizations and how you deal with local and national governments. I mean, what are, you know, how, in what ways do they help your organizations? In what ways do they sometimes have a hindrance for what you're doing? Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, that didn't work out. So I, so we set up a uh, independent nonprofit uh, with no money, so it was all self-funded. And what we did is we went in under the radar. I don't think the Louisville University administration knew we were there for two years. We were just working with the uh, Department of Security, establishing facts on the ground. And then once we had a track record, then we were able to negotiate a, a agreement of understanding with the university. Now, in Africa, everything is done, everything is in slow motion. So unbelievably, it took four years to negotiate a contract with the, with the university that says uh, they can they can get rid of us anytime they want within 30 days of no, notice, and we can leave anytime we want uh, if we're giving 30 days of notion, uh, notice, and no money changed hands. And that took four years of negotiation, if you can believe it. But that's, that's why we're there. I mean, if we had an efficient uh, system working, we would need to be there. So we went, we went in under the radar, established facts on the ground, and then we were able to work our uh, way up. Yes. I have a question for you. Uh, now that you've been doing this, this great work that you guys are doing, uh, you've been doing this for a few years now. Eight years. Eight years now. If you were to think about uh, one of the factors that would actually enable a significant amount of scale, what you've done here to replicate in many other countries, I'm sure there's a lot more places that you're part of what you're doing. What are those two or three factors, the compelling factors, to create that scale? Okay, well, that's a, that's a great question. And actually, we're going to have a retreat with my organization next month to, uh, to deal with that question of sustainability. One of, my, uh, one of our previous trainees just went to the Mwanza Medical School, which is in western Tanzania, and invited me to come. So I'm going to Tanzania next month, and I'm going to fly to Mwanza and give it, and he invited me to give our ICU course uh, to his residents because they don't, they don't know much about intensive care. Uh, so we're hoping to, uh, to spread the area, to uh, spread our work throughout Tanzania and East Africa. There are two main, uh, two main impediments right now. One is money, and that's one of our, uh, one of our uh, goals. We're, we're, not, we're not very good at fundraising because uh, it's not our skill set. We've had trouble getting people on, the, on our board of directors with that skill set, so we're going to deal with that. The other thing is attracting volunteers because we're asking somebody to fly to the other side of the world on their own dime, give up earned income for somewhere between two and four weeks uh, that they would have made in, the, in a high income country. Their colleagues have to cover for them while they're disappearing and then go work for free some, uh, somewhere else in a, in a, in a resource constrained environment. So if, given all those difficulties, we have managed to cover between five and eight months a year. We're trying to, we would like to cover 10 months a year of teaching, but as you can see from my presentation, we have accomplished a lot with no money. And we're, you know, there are other things, when you see the amount of money that's spent, uh, you, know, with, you know, with creating white elephants that are never used, and we basically, uh, we, we basically got it. I was served as the president of the Pacific Coast Surgical Association, so in my role there, I sort of strong out and give you guys $25,000 to, to run the organization. So we got that grant, and, and then it's been self-funded with a couple of our friends chipping in, and that's it, that's, it. And that's, that's, that's basically money. So if we could get money, and if we could uh, uh, make it easier for volunteers, particularly for nurses, the nurse, it's even harder to get the nurses because they, they're, uh, they, they don't have, uh, they have less disposable income, and in addition to that, uh, they are working in a very, very rigid uh, uh, employment system that doesn't recognize the value of going uh, and, and, and doing this work. And we're, we're, we're beginning, as part of our retreat, we're going to begin to have discussions with CEOs of healthcare systems to see if we can change that attitude. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Maybe it's related. Um, knowing what you know right now, based on years of experience, if you have to redo it, how do you think your would your approach be different? Uh, with my approach in terms of what I'm doing in Tanzania? How do you how do you start it? How do you um, I don't think it would have been different. And I'll tell you what, I have I have friends that have 
And they, they said, well, you should have talked to the Minister of Health. You should have talked to this and talked about that. And ideally, I think that's true. Uh, but uh, when you're working in a system which is uh, filled with corruption, as I, as I indicated, uh, and in which uh, everything has to get rubber stamped. I told you, it took us four years to get a simple piece of paper like that negotiation. You can imagine if I would have started a top-down type of situation, it would be eight years later, nothing would have happened. So uh, I think it's a great question. Ideally, we should have worked with the Ministry of Health and the, the bosses of the university. Uh, I actually wanted, I tried to set up a nursing initiative through the administration of the university five years ago. They didn't want to, they didn't want to have anything to do with it except this. And I, I tried again working at a lower level with the, with the you know, middle level of nursing management. That's why we, that's how we were able to set up a nursing initiative, which I think is very important because you really can improve surgical outcomes if you go and improve surgical nursing. One question I have for all three of you would be, how did your experience in Harvard College, Binghamton University, influence what you're doing now? Whether it maybe was a class that was particularly influential or an extracurricular activity, or maybe both. My background is in psychology and pretty law. Well. I was a CPL student in psychology as an undergrad. And part of that experience as a psychology student, we had obviously internships. One of them was at ICD. I had completed that and uh, moved on to school of education and then work and everything else. And then eventually, returning to the field as a behavior analyst, um, keeping in the back of my mind the experience that I had as an undergrad uh, intern. Uh, then really helped me find the support and collaborative, uh, collaborative partners at the university when we were um, in the process of establishing Seven Stones. And, um, and I think that experience from the very beginning as an undergrad really laid the foundation for the work that I was doing later on. So all of my degrees were from the Department of Political Science, although the master's degree was the precursor to what is now a Master of Public Administration. And so I think there are a couple of things um, that, that played a role. Um, one is a, kind of an exposure to both um, domestic focus and an international focus, and an appreciation for the importance of working in both of those arenas. Um, and then at the master's level and continuing into the PhD program, um, the, the skills to do rigorous evidence-based research and decision-making, but apply that in practical settings, not only in, in academic work, but also to kind of speak to practice. Um, and and uh, that was, those were some of the things that, that stuck with me. It's actually been kind of fun as I'm working with the Institute now, reconnecting with a faculty member I had um, as a freshman student at, at Weissband, who is uh, no longer at Binghamton University, but is on our advisory board. He's a great, great professor. Well, I was also a political science major, and uh, I think the uh, I think when I when I took a political philosophy course, I was reading Plato and Aristotle. The idea of uh, in, uh, the philosopher king pursuit of excellence. I think that was good. And I was actually headed for a military and intelligence career, uh, and, and I got sort of turned. I think I was in, I was in the sixty generation. I got turned off by the Vietnam War. And my mom had been a uh, combat surgical nurse during the Normandy invasion. So I figured, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go the other route. I'm going to try to become a, uh, a peaceful warrior, so to speak. So I decided to, I, I, I decided to go to medical school. But I, I definitely, uh, definitely uh, the philosophy uh, the reading that I did uh, here at Harper was, was a critical element to my decision. And the other thing was participation in intercollegiate athletics. I was on, I think Steve's there, uh, and uh, we were on the track team together, and I was on the swimming team, and uh, I think, uh, you know, working my guts up over the side of the pool in those interval sprints, just talking to <laughs> keep, keep on, keep going, you know, when going gets tough, the cup kept going. The coach had a pyramid on the wall of the pool, at the bottom of the hurt, the middle of the pain, the other pyramid was pain, and the apex was agony. 
And we, <laughs> the goal was that each work got to try to reach agony. And so I became a surgical trainee, which was quite a similar instrument. <laughs> Some administrator came along and said, I want to provide an incentive for the three of you to come up with something that you could do together, mm -hmm. and interdisciplinary, maybe not moving within what you're doing. What would it be? Well, for me, it would just be an invitation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the uh, majority of my work is focused on, at this point, professional development and training of other professionals and paraprofessionals. Um, and so I think the, the biggest focus uh, and something that we could potentially do together is develop training that can be taken globally, can be taken worldwide. And that's something that you know, Bill is already doing, some of it is what I'm already doing. Um, and of course, you know, that I come into it with that bias because I feel that that's the most important. But that is how you can get more people um, on the ground to do individual work to improve lives um, everywhere globally. So I feel that tra developing training um, for whatever profession that you're in, you should have for others to benefit from, to take your work forward, um, is probably the best way to collaborate. So, so a way to educate our students on how to be a good international active player yeah. in Africa in surgery, in India for autism, or in Rwanda, or but the preparation could be the same for all three of those paths. Uh, is that what you're saying? Something, something? Um, I think uh, to, to some degree, yeah. I think the preparation starts here, and um, as a college student, they um, that level of exposure is critical for undergrads to begin with, with internships, with placements, with exposure. And that's something that you know we have some undergrads already coming to um, to India to study Sloan Center for um, for a small amounts of time, for about three to four weeks. We've had a number of undergrads come, um, but uh, I think it is critical to have that level of um, you know training and exposure to whatever field they're interested in. Um, and, and that begins at the undergraduate level. And I would say there actually already is a connection, but that could be formalized. I interpret, because I have a very broad definition of what constitutes atrocity prevention, I interpret the work that Bill and Svetlana do as contributing to atrocity prevention. Um, and so there are opportunities for students um, and for research projects to engage with that in terms of how education and, and, and surgical services in otherwise inaccessible areas for providing access actually does reduce the risks of atrocities in those places. And so we, could, we obviously, we absolutely could partner. Yeah, I would just say that uh, this is almost uh, not uh, fashionable enough. I'm a firm believer in a broad liberal education, similar to the one that I got at Harvard, and where you where where where, where I read broadly, uh, fell in love with learning, and uh, had a chance uh, for four years to think about what direction uh, my, I wanted to go in my life, and that. Uh, I learned my trade, so to speak, or you know, focused down on a particular area of knowledge after I completed the broad education. I know now most parents want to send their kids to college so they can actually get a job and, and, and earn a living. And I'm, as a parent myself, I'm very sensitive to that. However, I, I really think that the, uh, that the broad liberal education that I got at Harper helped me define how I wanted to live my life. And uh, and it just sort of gave me a direction, and you know, and sort of you know, you're like a narrow beating the bow, and it'd be hard for the wind takes a little bit in whatever direction it's going to take. But at least you're you're pointed in a certain direction. One question I have is probably more for Bill and Salam because now you touched on this toward the end of your talk. What advice or what thoughts would you have for somebody that feels that they would like to do something intact or something that's going to affect some social change? Because sometimes the thought is, it has to be huge. I have to 
empty my life savings to fund a nonprofit is not obvious. Uh, it has to be something that's sweeping worldwide, or else why do it? But most of the time, it's not going to be huge. It's going to be something on a smaller scale, but, but in package is the same. You know, when we started Stepping Stone Center, it really wasn't uh, with the thought of making it huge or uh, changing the world. It really started with one kid and uh, with an intention to do something within my professional scope uh, that will be impactful for that particular child, for that family. Uh, and then we grew organically. It really just evolved with um, you know, more needs presented themselves and then we were able to find the answers to those needs. So I think that it really doesn't matter. Uh, you, know, you, you cannot begin with an intention that this is what you're going to do and this is going to be the end result. You have to start with the need that is there and how can you answer that need? How can you provide an answer to um, you know, a problem that's presenting itself to you? I think that's a great question. And my advice to anybody who's thinking about this is first of all, you have to keep your eye on the donut and not on the hole. You got to focus on your family. First of all, you have to take care of your family. And I know so many people are on you know ten different boards, and every 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 you know, three or four nights a week, you're out at a different meeting. And and uh, you got you have to first of all, you have to take, have a Confucian sort of speak, uh, aspect and take care of yourself and then your family. And then once that's taken care of, you you can you think about what's important to you. And it has to, you have to either feel a personal responsibility or it's got to be a passion, whether it's in the arts or whatever, whatever, whatever it may be. And then, uh, and, and then uh, you, can, you, you can't do it alone. You have to get a, some, a, a, a friend, a board of directors, if you, if you wish, even if it's not called a board of directors. And my advice is to choose the best people that you can. And also, look at your own skill set. Like I've got holes in my in, in my in my ability to drive a truck. Uh, and, but, you know, I mean, I I know I have to take care of patients, to operate, but I'm I'm, a, I'm an idiot at building organizations. So I got a friend of mine who is a hospital CEO and should be president of the United States. He's the most organized human being in the face of time. So he 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 actually taught me about organizations, and I didn't know it. I didn't really, this is not part of my skill set. So you have to, and that's what part of our, part of our uh, retreat the next month is going to be. We're at a certain point, and if we want to take it to the next level, we have to say, well, what, what, what skill sets are we missing, and how, how are we going to move this uh, thing further? And the last thing I would, my advice is, it's got to be fun. <laughs> if you're trying to do something, and it's not fun, it's going to fail. And it's not only got to be fun for you, it's got to be fun all the people who are participating. That's my question. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? We'll be here a little bit longer, so if you think of something that you'd like to ask on a one-on-one -on -one basis, please feel free to come up, say hello, introduce yourself, and uh, we would uh, definitely welcome the conversation. So can we have one more round of applause for our